So, Osama, let's, let's just dive right into it. Syria has been dominant in the news for the last two years, close to 100,000 people dead, millions of refugees, mostly women and children, alleged use of chemical weapons, the economy has ceased to function for two years. This has been going on and on. Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? And how do the rebels and the opposition have the courage to persist amidst violence that's so terrible? Well, it's a survival um, um, issue for the rebels on the, on the ground. You can't expect people to sit armed-folded waiting to be slaughtered, and they have to do something about it. it um, uh, whether this will be ended um, through just a, a tip of balance of power on the ground, perhaps that's highly unlikely. It's it turned into more of a, a regional and an international conflict at this stage, unless there's a deal between the Western countries and Russia on one hand, and regionally between Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Iran, it's very um, difficult to resolve this on the ground because the pipeline, the, the, the lifeline of the regime is, is still there. The, um, uh, uh, the Iranian um, government and the Russian government are, keep supplying Assad with whatever necessary of not only ammunition and weapons, but also um, technologies, um, uh, strategists. Uh, you have the Iranian Republican Guards now leading operations, planning operations. You have Hezbollah fighters more than 5,000 in, in Syria, they're incurring casualties. Even today, about 25 people uh, or fighters from Hezbollah got killed in fight with uh, uh, the FSA, more than 75 got injured. Uh, so unless there's some kind of a deal, uh, it is very, uh, or the um, supporters of Assad stop supporting Assad, uh, it's very highly uh, unlikely it will end in the near future. Now, it's, it's a big decision to become a leading member of the opposition in, in, in Syria. You have family there, you have friends there. It's a regime that's known for its persecution and its lack of tolerance against members of the opposition. You know, surely this is something you sleep on before deciding to do it. How did you, what is your personal story of how you got involved? When I got involved because I helped, uh, I was working for the, uh, you know, for a, a European entity at the time and uh, early 2000, and um, I helped some activists uh, getting some funding uh, to document poverty uh, and some of the mass management of the uh, 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 administrative council's issues in the country through lenses, just taking pictures and posting them on a certain interactive map online. Um, they were arrested, the equipments were confiscated, and when I landed in the airport, I was uh, arrested at the time. Um, and how, how long were you, were you detained for? Uh, for about a month, um, but because of who I worked for and uh, and other issues and people got involved and I was released, but I was told if we ever see your face again, you will never see the light. Um, and and when, when you were in prison for that month, yeah. uh, what, what, what happened? It wasn't a very uh, uh, in, you know, fancy experience, of course. Um, but that got me uh, personally um, intrigued and interested and, and determined to help in any way possible. And then from that day, uh, back in, you know, uh, at that time, I, I got involved with the opposition activities, training activists on a violent struggle, and I did my master's thesis on color revolutions and peaceful, uh, uh, peaceful struggle and nonviolent struggle. And then, uh, when the uprising started, obviously we were involved uh, from day one. Now, when you uh, when you look at what's happening in Syria right now, it seems that every day there's a new world leader standing up saying we need to intervene. Yes. President Obama has gotten up and called for intervention. Prime Minister Cameron has gotten up and called for intervention. Uh, after there was a bombing in Turkey, allegedly by Bashar al-Assad's regime, uh, Prime Minister Erdogan said just last week that anybody who attacks Turkey will pay the price. Well, it appears Turkey's been attacked. Hillary Clinton, before she left office, told the Syrian regime that the sand in the hourglass is running out. Now, what does all of this sound like to the opposition, given none of it seems to be being backed up? Um, it seems that the regional uh, powers who are supporting the um, opposition on the ground uh, uh, specifically Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Gulf countries, and other, the rest of the Arab world, are more anxious to end this because of fear of spilling over to the, uh, to the region. Um, Turkey is, is way advanced also. They were willing to do things, and they were all kind of held up by, by Washington for some time. It's very unfortunate because of also the White House calculation of how things will um, end or may go wrong. Uh, we see Britain, France also urging all the time uh, uh, President Obama and the White House that things need to be uh, done and done quickly. Uh, and if intervention took place, any kind of intervention doesn't have to be necessarily uh, put on the ground or a very uh, classical military intervention. But if that took place a year ago, think of the casualties that could have been saved, 
Think of the sectarian divide that could have been uh, perhaps avoided. Think of the spillover and the uh, uh, regional now deadlock that we have and the intervention by uh, 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 um, Hezbollah and others. And think of the other extremist fighting groups that flourished and sprouted all over the country, but yet still at lower numbers, by the way, not as it's portrayed in the media. Uh, but that all could have been avoided if an earlier intervention took place. Not, again, not necessarily a classic military one. Now, President Obama uh, said somewhat infamously uh, several months ago that if chemical weapons were used in Syria, mm. they would draw a red line. Uh, now, there's two problems with this that, that, that I'd like to ask you about. One is, does that mean everything else is OK? And how was that interpreted in Syria? And then two, now that we firmly believe that chemical weapons have been used uh, and there's no action being taken, what is it, again, what does this specific incident mean to you all in the opposition? Well, you're right. Uh, it was actually perceived uh, as if President Obama, I mean, on the ground in Syria, as if President Obama is um, saying anything else that can use conventional weapons is fine, including missiles and uh, airstrikes and tanks in the street. But once you use chemical weapons, it's, uh, it's a red line. Uh, yes, he, you know, he didn't mean it that way, but that's sort of how, how people understood it, uh, especially with the um, com you know, inaction by, by the US uh, at, uh, at that level. Um, uh, but... Uh, Assad and whoever is in his camp and advising him and the country supporting him uh, know that Washington is just going to talk the talk at this stage and not walk the walk. Uh, it's just a, a rhetoric. Uh, until Washington reaches a deal with Russia uh, on Syria and how the uh, outcome could be, uh, then uh, all these threats would be just, uh, I think, empty. Now let me be provocative for, right. for, for a moment because there, there, there's a common critique uh, probably all too common critique that you hear in policy circles, both in Europe and the United States, which is, we don't know who the opposition is. Uh, they're mixed up with Al-Qaeda and Al-Nusra. The bad guys are the ones with the weapons who are better organized. If they come to power, they're going to massacre the Alawites. If they come to power, we don't know what their position on Israel will be. This is a mess. Now, how would you address those critiques? Well, obviously, there are answers to all these questions, all, uh, uh, mostly myths. Number one, we don't know who the opposition are. You, you, you know, been seeing opposition in every major outlet, every place and every corner for the past two years. Were they able to talk before then? No. They were massacred, they were harassed, they were uh, uh, persecuted, they were jailed. It's a police state, nothing worse than Syria than, than, than North Korea, um, uh, you know, when it comes to these issues. Um, uh, are they uh, fragmented? Yes, what do you expect from a, a political uh, opposition that has not had the chance to talk to each other, or meet, or convene, or practice politics, or, or, or governance, or any of that uh, 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 of these issues, uh, for decades. So of course they have to learn this uh, uh, from the ABC, and the learning curve has been really, really remarkable. Uh, whether the opposition, the uh, moderate forces or secular, are mixed with extremists and stuff, we have to d differentiate between the political opposition and the fighters on the ground. That's number one, and number two, on the ground. You have a, a vast spectrum of, of, of fighters. You have the main bulk, which is the FSA, Free Syrian Army, who are defected soldiers and officers, professionally trained army men uh, and women. And uh, uh, those are obviously majority secular. And then you have the civilians who picked up arms uh, uh, just to defend their you know, farms and, and, and neighborhoods and, and, and families. And then on the right of that, you have the... Uh, 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 extremists or religious fighters or whoever flew in to fight. But what are the percentages? Uh, even intelligence agencies estimate the, the foreign fighters in Syria or whoever associated with the global jihad networks, i.e. Al-Qaeda, do not exceed 1,200 to 1,500 fighters. And you're talking about thousands of thousands of defectors and thousands of civilians carrying <laughs> arms. But again, it's, it's an interesting uh, a story in the media to tell. Or they are fighting. It's, it's over magnified in the media. Uh, um, but what, and again, if intervention took place earlier, if such, any kind of a deal have, would have been reached at, at an earlier stage, we wouldn't have been dealing with this now. Now, one last quick question, which is it's very clear that courage is able to persist on the ground you know, in ways that it's very difficult for any of us here to, to imagine. Uh, but we also know that courage alone isn't enough to be able to, to, to topple a brutal regime and replace it with something more moderate that will better the lives of Syrian people. So what is missing? And more specifically, when you look out at this audience, you have tons of influential people from lots of different sectors. I think people in the audience want to know, what can they do to help? Well, there are lots of things. Number one is the keep the story alive. 
it's very important to keep the story alive because that maintains the pressure on Assad's camp. Uh, uh, the story goes up and down in the front pages and the uh, headlines if there is a major massacre in some kind of neighborhood. If there are 200 children slaughtered in one night in their homes, then it sees the, uh, again, it's back on the front pages. We want to keep that story alive, and that's a very important thing for the producers, news producers, for the media uh, uh, sector. Uh, financial help and support, the NGOs, is also needed. Um, um, I'm also advising the, you know, the, the coalition now on, on, on major projects, the infrastructure, the telecom, the gas and oil, for the post Assad era. And all these ex expertise are needed, all the, the support we can get now from these sectors on how to reform, rebuild all these sectors later is also uh, important. Technology, use, use of technology to bust the, the uh, 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 narrative of Assad and his, his, um, his camp also of what's going on. We need to use technology to, to actually uh, prove that the data and the information they're using are all lies and propaganda and pure lies and, and uh, here's uh, the evidence by using these uh, kind of technological tools. So that all these things could be used uh, and uh, there are always ways to help. Osama, I could talk to you all day about this. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're, we're out of time, but I think I can safely speak for everybody when I express my admiration for what you're doing and the constant fight for freedom and democracy in your country. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You for having me. Thank you.